Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people that are the traditional custodians of the land where I'm located today. And I'd invite any of you to, um, who wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where you are located by writing in the chat. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders both past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. I'd also like to remind everyone that this session is being recorded. And finally, on with the show. My name is Kayleen Manwerick and I'm your host today for the second session in the Challenges for a Cyber Physical World Seminar Series. Nearly 10 years ago, I was first inspired to begin my own research on the cyber physical world by an article on pervasive computing in shopping malls. This was an unusual collaboration then between a legal academic and an architecture scholar. The necessity for interdisciplinary understanding and collaboration in this area has only increased this since then. So this series is intended for anyone who recognises the need to learn about challenges in a cyber physical world from a variety of disciplinary perspectives. So on behalf of the Allens Hub and the IEEE Society on Social Implications for Te Technology, I'd like to welcome you all here today. But moving on to the interesting part, thank, welcome to today's session on artificial intimacy. What happens when involved mind and old fashioned cultures encounter 21st century technology? It's my very great pleasure to introduce Scientia um, Professor Rob Brooks as your speaker. But if I was to list all of his achievements, we'd be here for the whole hour. So we've only got time for some severely edited highlights. Rob is the Professor of Evolution and Director of the Evolution and Ecological Research Centre at the University of New South Wales. His new book, Artificial Intimacy, Virtual Friends, Digital Lovers and Algorithmic Matchmakers, has been hailed as a great example of how to use an evolutionary perspective on human nature to illuminate an emerging evolutionarily unprecedented area of modern human life. His first book, Sex, Genes and Rock and Roll, How Evolution Has Shaped the Modern World, won the 2012 Queensland Literary Award for Science Writing. He writes a regular column for the conversation called Natural His History of the Present on how an evolutionary view can help us understand our modern world and the lives we lead. He also received the 2013 Eureka Prize for Communicating Science and Research. So we're going to let Professor Brooks speak and then we're going to um, have time for questions after that. Um, since we're a large group today, it's going to be the easiest to manage that through the chat. So please put your questions in the chat at any time. And at the end of Professor Brooks's talk, I will be going through the chat and presenting the questions to Professor Brooks. So thank you, Rob. Thank you so much, Kayleen. It's such um, such a pleasure to be speaking here um, and to, to have this chance to talk to uh, people from Allen's Hub um, in particular. Um, it's slightly terrifying uh, because I must stress at the beginning, the technology is not really my specialty or, or my thing at all. I'm an evolutionary biologist. I study the tensions between cooperation and conflict that infuse the living world, especially those tensions around sex and reproduction and family living. Um, and for some time, I've been sort of struggling to write a book about human nature and its relationship to culture um, and really struggling with it. And then during that time, I was lucky enough to run a program here at UNSW called Grand Challenges, where I got to work with so many of the university's most impressive minds. And um, one of our Grand Challenges concerned living, um, how to live with 21st century technology. And that was led by your director, Professor Liria Bennett Moses, and working with Liria and with, you know, so many incredible UNSW colleagues and then outside um, people, some of whom will get a bit of a mention today. Um, really gave me a view that what we should be looking at if we're interested in human nature is not um, just the past, but also how that and culture interact, not just with each other, but with the enormous changes that are being wrought by technology, particularly technologies like robotics um, and virtual reality, and most of all, artificial intelligence, um, because they are starting to have an effect on our social and interpersonal lives. And so I will give you a bit of a tour of that today. If it seems a little weird and if there's some uncanny valley stuff going on, um, 
it feels a bit strange because I've had the traditional slide trauma, uh, which is why we started a little bit late. And so Kayleen is driving my click intensive um, PowerPoint deck. So Kayleen, could we have the first slide? I might put my hand up or something like that to for clicks and just hope I sort of anticipate them correctly. Um, there, the next slide. There we go. Um, so what do I mean when I talk about artificial intimacy? Um, I talk, uh, I, I really mean, generally speaking, when machines push our evolved social buttons. Um, not a watertight definition, um, but I also talk about a class of technologies, which I call artificial intimacies, um, and I divide them into three different groups that are overlapping and, of course, like all Venn diagrams, highly artificial distinctions. Um, but um, it's, I'll, I'll run off the notes on my computer, so I'll look sort of off to the, off to the right from time to time. Um, so that, that slide's just perfect. Um, so the, the three classes that I've distinguished are digital lovers, which is the one everybody's interested in, um, in the newspapers and the like, uh, because that's where the sex robots live. Um, and then there's the virtual, rea virtual friends, um, which I think are going to become the most important and consequential class. And then the algorithmic matchmakers, which are the ones that are very much already reshaping um, all sorts of behavior. Um, can we have a click on the slides? So you're going to work just as hard as I am here. Um, <laughs> um, click again. OK, perfect. So here's a bunch of um, things that I've envisaged. The things with ticks next to them already exist in some form um, at the moment. So the, the sex robots that I started off with, um, they don't really exist in any you know uh, profound way. But right now, we have what I call sex doll bots, which are really sex dolls with a little bit of movement and um, a clunky chatbot built in. But I think that the, the big promise will be for that technology and for other sort of virtual reality equivalents of that will be when um, the, the virtual friend technologies that uh, allow um, by which machines can learn how to interact with us socially sort of on our terms um, are, are mixed with the digital lover technology. And I think that will be a very interesting, exciting, potentially terrifying uh, world. Let's go to the next slide. We begin here with Sherry Turkle, who's one of the most profound thinkers um, and authors about the interactions between people and technologies, social technologies. And she wrote in the New York Times not that long ago, 2018, uh, there will never be an age of artificial intimacy. Robots, she says, may be better than nothing, but they still won't be enough. Um, and I plead no contest to the fact that they might not be enough, but I think that sometimes better than nothing is um, better than nothing, really. And I think a lot of the, the discussion I'll talk about today is, you know, um, firstly, um, a, a lot of the technologies will learn how to interact with us, whether we like the end product or not. Um, and secondly, um, there's, a, there's a great deal of um, that's missing in people's lives. Um, and that some of those gaps, I think, can, can be filled and will be filled in a fairly chaotic way um, by technologies. So, the area that I do my own research in is more up at the top of those three bullet points, the evolved sexual and social traits. And those traits, um, the ways in which we build relationships and conduct our relationships are really iterative and in many ways algorithmic. The algorithm is designed by natural selection to solve adaptive problems, how to find friends, how to build allegiances, how to build trust, how to find a mate, um, how to cooperate with them in order to raise a family. Um, we know, we've know we known for some time, at least since the 1960s, that computers are social actors, that people are very happy to anthropomorphize um, and to, um, to treat machines as, as if they were to some degree human, even when they know explicitly that they aren't. Um, and machines are getting quite good at emulating and mimicking those evolved social algorithms. And then the last one is um, that machine learning in particular is one of the most potent design algorithms ever, and I will compare it with other design algorithms that are important um, and show that, you know, I, I think that, that this area of artificial intimacy is just only going to get bigger and bigger. Go the next. So we'll begin here with this little fella, 
if you know your your robots or your robotic dogs, you'll know this is Ibo, the first generation robotic dog made by Sony and released in 1999. And it looks kind of more robot than dog. Um, now, when Sony were developing Ibo, they consulted Georgia Tech roboticist Ron Arkin. And Ron came out to speak to us um, at Grand Challenges a while back. And I had dinner with him and with Toby Walsh and with Lyria. Um, and we had a, a bit of a discussion about his work with um, with Ivo. And he said at the time, um, while I was still busy thinking about how am I going to shape this book, he said at the time, you know, I'm, I'm not too worried about sex robots, which a lot of the discussion been about. But what I am worried about is when robots learn to do intimacy. Because of what I saw when we were working on and advising Sony and consulting to them about the development of this Ivo program, he um, and his team basically studied how dogs behave. They did what, what I would do as an animal behavior expert. Um, and they looked at how dogs interact with humans and how they get our attention and show affection and basically how they make us fall in love with them. And they were basically tapping into an ancient evolutionary story. And that is the story, click please, in which humans domesticated dogs. So dogs come from um, gray wolves domesticated in East Asia and South Asia probably in a number of different domestication events that then came to be kind of mixed up once, you know, dogs became more widespread. Um, wolves are already quite social animals. They have some social skills because they work in packs, um, but they can be, especially around humans, flighty and stressy and they can snarl and they can bite, especially if they think they're being trapped. Um, but starting about 30,000 years ago in Southeast Asia, people would tend to tolerate the less snappy, snarly wolves. As long as the wolves cause no harm, they kind of didn't mind having them around. And I think they probably chased off, you know, bigger, nastier predators. That was one of the things. Um, and humans started to not really mind the slightly more social wolves and, you know, occasionally share food with them, etc. But every time a wolf bit someone or killed someone or hurt someone, that wolf would be either banished or um, destroyed. And that alone is natural selection at work. It's just that humans are imposing the natural selection. So we often talk about it as artificial selection. And they didn't know what they were doing. They were just killing dogs they didn't like and occasionally adopting a puppy that was very cute. Um, and that was kind of playful. Now, um, Darwin recognized 150 years ago that whenever humans domesticate an animal, uh, the animal evolves to become a less aggressive, more playful, more relaxed, um, animal with a shorter snout and bigger eyes and ears. They call this domestication syndrome. And you can look at, um, if you look at the neuroanatomy of dogs now or of any kind of domesticated animal, you'll see these repeated things that happen to the brains that basically um, make them uh, retain a lot of the juvenile playful features. And that's exactly what humans were doing. As they were domesticating dogs, they were basically extending puppyhood into adulthood. Um, and, you know, we still have that relationship and we're very tuned to that relationship. We love dogs. A lot of people love dogs. Dogs love humans, of course. And um, when a dog bites somebody, it's often destroyed before it makes the 6 p.m. news. Um, when we go to pick up a dog and we want to adopt a dog, we pick the playful ones, the most puppy-like ones, even if they're adult adults. Um, and that's what we find cute. And so... Um, that domestication syndrome is really important. And what you can see in the top right of the slide is, oh, sorry, one thing I forgot to mention is that with Ibo, um, people love their dogs. They really love their robotic dogs so much so that they would send off to get them repaired um, and send off for parts. And then in 2006, Sony was having trouble and it shut down the Ibo project. Um, and people were bereft, especially when they couldn't repair their dogs. And in fact, there were some uh, elaborate Buddhist funerals held for robots when they sort of reached the end of their long walkies and couldn't be repaired anymore. And so, you know, there was a lot of loyalty when people brought them back. And you can see that they are now much more puppy-like and their eyes are bigger and they're more playful and they are now able to learn and they send information to central servers that then, you know, mine that information. And obviously there's a, a bit of AI going on there now, which there wasn't in, in the early um, IBO, as I understand it. So we've got this sort of recapitulation of the domestication of dogs that's, that's happened here. Um, now, I, th I think the key thing here is that um, roboticists and technologists have tapped into our very human capacity to love dogs and to love the kinds of interactions that we have with dogs. Can you have the next slide, please? 
So this is um, the kind of imp improvement algorithm the product development goes through from IBO 1.0 to the current versions of IBO. It gets better. Um, it tends to be very slow. Why? Because it's done within one company. Maybe you're bringing in secrets from for, or bringing in you know new technologies and new ideas from other places in the world. But it tends to be commercial in confidence, so it's quite secretive, and the improvement is quite linear. We click again, please. Um, compare that sort of product development uh, algorithms with the um, similarly algorithmic processes in which uh, we domesticate animals or in which natural selection just shapes wild animals. Um, they are very slow. Why are they slow? Because basically it's all about reproduction in evolution. Uh, it's all about genes going from one individual to the descendants or not. And the selection is the sifting out of those genes um, and the pre preservation of the ones that are effective at doing what it is that they do um, and the removal of genes and combinations of genes that are not as effective. So um, gene flow is very important, uh, but genes come from all around the species range. So in that regard, they've, um, natural selection is very effective because genes come from everywhere and it works over a very long period. So it creates incredible adaptation. It, it in creates, creates incredible improvement but it's slow because it's generation to generation. In bacteria or in viruses, as we're finding out during the pandemic, it's fast because the generation time is short. In humans, it's incredibly slow because it takes, you know, 30 years for a generation to turn over. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. So long before humans ever domesticated dogs, they domesticated an even more important species, our own. We basically tamed ourselves and we tamed one another. In the five million or so years since we last shared an ancestor with chimpanzees and the bonobos, um, humans have changed from tree living apes, these are bonobos on the top left of the slide, um, tied to shrinking you know, pockets of rainforest into cosmopolitan, highly versatile apes that can live in just about any habitat that you might imagine. Um, we just had the Tokyo Olympics and the fact that there is a Tokyo that tens of millions of people can live more or less on top of each other and cooperate and cross the lights at more or less the right time. And then we can fly people in from around the world, from different tribes and different groups, people who've never met each other, who are fiercely competitive with one another, put them in a stadium, have them compete against each other and not kill each other is remarkable from an animal behavior point of view. From the point of view of, um, you know, the, the way in which social creatures, even highly social cooperative creatures work, that is bizarre that we can do that. And yet we're very good at it and we kind of take it for granted. We, we were very down on humanity and all the antisocial and uncooperative things people do because we notice them, but also because we're, we're designed to police that and to basically select for, breed with, keep in our tribe, uh, support the people who are pro-social and get rid of the despots wherever we can, get rid of the violent antisocial people wherever we can. And that's what we've done for at least the last 100,000 years, but probably for the better part of the last 5 million years, our ancestors have done that. Can we have a click, please? Um, and one of the distinctive things that happened, that's happened, that's allowed this to happen, is that our brains have got bigger. Click again, please. Slightly less obvious um, or less often talked about is the fact that men's testes have got much smaller and women's ovulation has become more cryptic. And these are very important because the way in which we reproduce has changed a great deal. And that is a big part of the domestication of humans, the taming of humanity. Another click, please. So somewhere between Bonobo and Tokyo, we've lived in small groups, roughly somewhere in the 100 to 200 people range most of the time and we have cooperated. One more click. Um, our mating system has gone from a sort of multi-male, multi-female, uh, free-for-all in which there is preferences and there is choice, but you know, everybody has a chance of mating with everybody else if, they, you know, if they're lucky enough, to a situation where we can focus on one mate or on a small number of mates for a period of time. That's not to say we're a monogamous ape or anything like that because we demonstrably aren't, but we're pretty damn good at monogamy better than you know, 99% of, of all other mammals um, and, and that we can focus on and we can cooperate with another mate. And it's that cooperation that matters. Where parental care in 
the, our closest relatives is maternal and brief. And even though there's an ongoing association, mums don't do that much for their offspring. Um, in our parental care lasts a very long time. You know, children leave home at about what 35 now, and uh, there's an enormous investment of human capital basically um, in that parenting. And we do it. Uh, mums do it. Dads do it. Um, extended relatives do it. Non-relatives do it. We're very cooperative. It takes more than a village to raise a child. It takes a whole society. And we click again, please. That cooperation has allowed us to live in bigger communities, nested communities, still small social groups, but then going up to sort of millions of people. We are able to do that uh, with the various psychological tricks. We can have about 150 to 200 friends. Those are people that we could just walk up to and um, in a bar and sit down and have a drink with them, and they had nothing. It wouldn't be too weird um, if we were drinkers, both. Um, and then. Um, we tend to, whereas apes and monkeys groom a lot, you can see those bonobos in the top left are, are grooming each other by picking at one another's fur. We groom, but we can gro groom more than one person at a time. And on average, we tend to groom about four people at a time because we, we chat, we have conversation. And in particular, we have gossip. We talk about people and things and events and who's doing what to whom and who's related to whom and who likes whom. And those things are actually the full engine of our cooperation. And that is why our brains are so big. More than anything else, it's that capacity for language and for more sophisticated language that's driven the evolution of big brains um, and allowed for cooperation and all the amazing things that we do. All right, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, the secret to those social changes were big um, changes in the algorithmic ways. We make friends and we draw them close. So here are bonobos, and what bonobos do is they groom. And the more you groom another bonobo, the closer they become to you, the more they're likely they are to be an ally. And the less you groom, the less likely they are to be an ally later on. And Robin Dunbar has done a lot of this work, and much of the next few slides is based on Robin Dunbar and his collaborators work and basically Dunbar has shown that the bigger your group size is, the larger the neocortex is, which is the big folded outer part of the of the brain. Um, because that's the part that, where, that allows us to, to gossip and to chat and to understand relationships and to understand, um, you know, who owes what to whom. And sorry, can we have one more click? Um, and um, so the, the bigger the group is, obviously, the more complex that becomes. And um, so, so can we just go back one slide? Um, yeah, the bigger the group, the more possible interactions, the more complicated that becomes, the more demanding it is. So there is a, uh, there's a cost in terms of brain size, in terms of headspace, on how social a species can be. There's also a cost in terms of time, which we'll come to in a moment. So now we'll go next to the next slide. Um, in humans, Dunbar has shown, um, infamously according to some people, that uh, we tend to have a, a range of nested relationships, um, and they begin with our very, very close relationship with our romantic partner or our best friend, or if we're very lucky, one of each. Um, and that's um, usually, it says one and a half, because some of us have only one person in that circle and some of us have two. Then you've got your emotional support group who are the people who are right there for you. And that's really your parents or your children or your sibling or something like that. And maybe your bestie, bestie, bestie. Okay. Then you've got the sympathy group, which is if they were to die suddenly, you would be absolutely devastated. Um, and that's roughly about 15. And so what you're seeing here is this general scaling of about um, one to three. The next size in concentric circles goes up by about a factor of three. 50 close friends. And this is the big one, 150 friends. 150 friends are the people that would be, you know, you'd have a pretty cooperative relationship with, you'd know what's going on in their lives. And Dunbar says that this mirrors the sort of average size of social groups in hunter-gatherer societies. Now that's argued about, um, but the crucial point is that you know you have more friends than you have close friends, and you have more acquaintances than you have friends. What the specific number is, and whether those numbers are different um, for uh, um, for different people, because some people are more social than others, those are interesting questions and worth arguing about. But there is a constraint, and the thing—can we click again, please? Um, 
the thing that influences where you are is gossip. The more you gossip with someone, the more you draw them in from being somebody that you used to know to somebody that you do know, to somebody that's a friend, to somebody that's a close friend, etc. We groom one another by gossip. And we spend about 20% of our waking hours grooming and gossiping, just as um, the uh, various apes do too, or, or at least that's the upper limit. So gossip is the iterative algorithmic process by which we make friends and we draw them near to us. Next slide, please. Um, and you can click again. So here's Joseph Weizenbaum, who's a very famous um, pioneering um, researcher in computer science, and he um, developed this fantastic early chatbot in the 1960s called um, Eliza. And the script that Eliza's just been having in discussing discussion with me, uh, you can see if you go to the website down the bottom, you can use it yourself. And the script's called Doctor, and it basically is a Carl Rogers type psychotherapist. It just asks you open, almost meaningless questions to encourage you to talk about yourself. Talking about ourselves is one way that we feel close to the person that we're talking to, especially if they're encouraging us to talk about ourselves. And machines are very good at doing that. Now, Joseph Weizenbaum, and I'm hoping Michael Caton yet gets a chance to play him because the resemblance suddenly strikes me. Um, uh, so, you know, maybe Australia can make that when we get a movie industry again. Um, nonetheless, um, uh, Weizenbaum showed and was, was staggered basically by the way in which people uh, would start to treat um, Eliza as if it was human. He actually said in one of his papers, once my secretary who had watched me work on the program for many months and therefore surely knew it to be a merely a computer program, started conversing with it. After only a few interchanges, she asked me to leave the room because it seemed like I was violating the privacy. The last bit on my words. Um, so very short exposures to simple computer programs can induce very powerful delusions of genuine social interaction. And we've known this since the 1960s. Computers are social actors. All right, let's go to the next slide. Now, intimacy is just, you know, friend, uber friendship, really. Um, the psychologists Arthur and Elaine Aaron um, are among the people who, a group of psychologists who've developed this notion of intimacy as really integrating the other into your sense of self. Could you click for another slide, please? Another, yeah, here we go. And one more time, see where that takes us. All right, yeah, the way in which we groom and the way in which we gossip in order to build intimacy is what's called escalating self-disclosure. We start with fairly trivial stuff and small talk, and then we start talking about stuff that's important to us. And the more important it is to us, the more the closer we get to the other individual. And if it's reciprocated because they give back in terms of disclosing important things, then we get at, um, to a position where intimacy starts to build. And the more intimate you become, the more the closer you become to somebody and you, you move into those inner social circles. Now, the Aaron's showed that this can actually be emulated or mimicked um, in the lab by getting people to work through a series of 36 questions that begin with sort of, you know, what did you have for dinner? And end with, you know, if you were to die tonight um, and, you know, what would you regret not having said to somebody and why? Um, and so if you work through these things in over a period of hours in the lab, you develop a, a certain amount of intimacy with somebody who's randomly assigned to you. And in fact, you know, famously, one of the, the couples in this experiment ended up getting married. Now, of course, um, Machines can do this. Firstly, you can download an app and you can work through these 36 questions if you like. There's a lot of apps. They don't all um, attribute it to the Aaron's um, or to anybody at all, but they do charge for it. Um, but nonetheless, 36 questions um, that you know are just one of those ways of establishing intimacy in a kind of a, a, a pre-prepared kind of a way. Can we click again, please? Um, now we know that when computers, if people are working on doing an experiment on a computer and a computer terminal, and uh, the computer terminal says, hey, look, I've, I've got a bit few bugs in my program and I'm a bit slow today, or something like that, you're disclosing a vulnerability, even though we know it to be complete nonsense. Um, and you know, if they really thought about it, the users would, would know it to be complete nonsense. But nonetheless, it's disclosing some vulnerability about itself. Then you get people to you know, get up and move around the room, et cetera, and you either put them back with the original computer that disclosed that to them or, or with another terminal. Um, and people will disclose more things to the terminal that said it was vulnerable. 
Um, so we know that basically machines can emulate this process of escalating self-disclosure. And that's, I think, a very important insight for the future of human grooming. Can we go to the next slide? Because social media, um, uh, one more click, please. Social media are now in this landscape by which we are making friends, drawing them near, becoming intimate. The gossip that we do with one another is now often done on social media. And social media companies, of course, are able to keep the data of what we say. And machine learning algorithms are able to learn from those data what keeps a conversation going, what keeps somebody interested, what draws people into self-disclosures, including what kinds of disclosures draw people into self-disclosures. It now seems like a very straightforward preposition, obviously, you know, lots of data, lots of clever programming, et cetera, but it's visible, it's very visible, just how possible it is for social media companies and for their machine learning algorithms to learn the secrets of friendship grooming and of gossip and of establishing intimacy. And they won't need the Aaron's 36 questions because there are always going to be more efficient ways out there. They can just learn from what works on us. And what works on a person like you might be what di what's dif might be different from what works on a person like me. So we can have personalized outcomes from this. So we're going from a position where the social media platforms start out as facilitating our gossip. But we already have Twitter bots interacting with us. We already have bots on all sorts of other platforms. And the potential for them to become actual genuine social actors that learn how to coax us into intimacy and then to do with that intimacy whatever it is that those algorithms are optimized to do is, um, is very real now. So we we are right on the cusp, I think, of having genuine virtual friends. Those virtual friends might be counselors. They might be genuine friends. They might be sales people. They may be political candidates or trial balloons for political candidates. They could be um, catfish. Um, they could be all kinds of abusive personas, just like um, we have in normal human social interactions. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, so I kind of jumped the gun a little bit on this point here, but um, obviously, Animal learning and human learning are much faster than natural selection, domestication, and product development in terms of learning. They operate often on, a, you know, a, a um, time scale of you know parts of a second. Um, they can be incredibly fast, and they can be incredibly powerful because no longer are we talking about linear flow of genes. We're talking about we can learn from peers. We can learn from anybody who's older than us. We can learn from people who are younger than us. And because of human culture, of course and written culture in particular, oral cultures, we can learn from people who are no longer alive and who haven't been alive for many, many generations. So these are also improvement algorithms, um, but they're incredibly effective. And the most important, I think, um, algorithm in the, in the future is going to be, or current, in, in the current day really, is machine learning. So can we have the click, please? Machine learning has the potential to be super fast, but it depends on the data. It depends on who has the data, what the quality of the data is, you know, what it looks like, etc. But think about it from the point of view of um, the differences between uh, natural selection and product development. Natural selection genes come from all over the species range. And then with human learning, they come from all sorts of different individuals, not necessarily relatives. And if the data is, you know, siloed, the machine learning is much more restricted than if the data is, you know, shared across all the major tech companies. So I, I don't really know a tremendous amount about um, that other than to know that that's an issue. And that's what keeps a lot of the people who are probably in the audience up at night. Let's go to the next slide before I get bring us all down too much. So machines can push our buttons. They're learning to push our buttons. Let's click a couple of times, please, Kelly. One more. Um, so our matchmaker algorithms are already using machine learning to deliver us mates or, um, you know, long term partners or, you know, one night stands or in the case of YouTube, just videos, um, videos that, you know, keep us on platform. Um, and, and often those choices that YouTube delivers, YouTube's an interesting example because 
um, the unsupervised machine learning that it seems to employ um, can deliver us things that we never even knew you, we, we were interested in. You know, I watch a few music videos and maybe a few instructional videos on YouTube, and next thing it's serving me up Russian slap biting, which is something I've never heard of. I don't suggest you Google it, but boy, it's diverting for a period of time. You just have to keep looking at it. Um, and YouTube is very good at that. So it's figuring out um, ways in which it might know us better than we know ourselves. Virtual friends, we already have the series and the Lexas. There are things like the MEND program for helping you um, overcome a breakup. There is um, There are confession apps, et cetera with varying degrees of sophistication of artificial intelligence, but they're there filling that niche of friends. And then our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and especially now TikTok, I think, are going from being matchmakers, bringing us together with people, you know, the, yeah, you should know this person because all your classmates from school 40 years ago know this person, et cetera, to actually generating content and grooming us themselves. And that seems to be where they're moving from purely matchmakers into that middle ground of social medium um, and potentially friendly brands. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, so I said that there was a, a, a headspace constraint, a cognitive constraint on how much time we can spend grooming. There's also, um, sorry, on how many people we can groom. There's also a time constraint. So the bigger the group size, and these are all different primate species, um, and this is, I think, some human estimates here. No, it isn't actually. Um, I think it's a baboon estimate. Humans are not on this graph. But, and don't worry about the fit lines. The crucial thing is that with very big groups, you're approaching around about 20% grooming time. It doesn't go over 20% grooming time. Why? Because a primate that grooms for more than 20% of its waking hours is not going to have enough time to get food. It's going to starve. So really, there's this direct trade-off between you know staying alive and staying connected. Now, interestingly, if we look at social media data, um, sorry, I'm busy clicking away as if I had control. Um, thank you. Uh, if we look at social media data in 2012, there were about 90 minutes a day, um, which was uh, about 8%, I think. Um, I, I thought I had the numbers there. 8% um, of our waking hours. In 2019, it was 153 minutes a day, which was now 16% of our waking hours. So if you think, we, we used to groom for about 20% of our waking hours. Now we groom people on um, social media, on average, for 16% of our waking hours. So something's got to give there. Firstly, it's real life relationships. We're spending a lot of time fighting with people on Twitter and, and chatting to people that we you know, would normally have fallen out of our friendship circle. And that has its, you know, its benefits and there's some things that are great about that. But it comes at the expense of our relationships with our partners and our children and our parents and our close friends, because the time that we spend doing one thing is not is time that we trade off against doing another thing. The other thing is that we're probably still doing a, a bit of that, and so we're probably exceeding 20% of our waking hours on social, um, uh, uh, social grooming, including social media, and that's cutting into sleep. And there's some indication that a lot of the sort of smartphone induced crisis in youth mental health, um, that the, one of the, the major candidate causes for that is cutting into time spent with family and cutting into sleep. Um, and we can talk about that later if we need to, but um, for now, I'll just make those assertions and you can go along with me if you wish. All right, um, can we click again, please? So, I haven't talked much about the sexy, um, the, the sexy artificial intimacies, the digital lovers. Um, here we have a, a current state of the art, the kind of thing that the newspapers obsess about. This is Harmony, the so-called sex robot. I call um, Harmony a doll bot. It's made by Realbotics in California. Realbotics make dolls. Um, looks a lot like a person, like a particular kind of person. There's a lot of really valid criticism about sex dolls and then and uh, the possible sex robots and the narrow range of trait values that they tend to represent. They tend to be gynoid, youthful, white, et cetera. Um, those are all important criticisms and discussions. Um, but for now, I think that, that the sort of sophisticated um, sort of dullness of this suggests to me that um, making them look or feel more lifelike is not the big engineering challenge right now. 
you know, we can figure out how to make um, them, and I, I think manufacturers will make them to whatever specifications people want. And that might even be going outside of humanoid forms. We don't need to be constrained by that and probably won't be in the future as people get more relaxed about these technologies. But I think that um, the way that they will ever become proper sex robots or, or you know, people might have more um, sustained relationships with them, um, and that's not to suggest they're going to be human replacing relationships, is if they get better at being virtual friends. And can we click again, please? And here we can really learn our lesson from the Nintendo DS game Love Plus. So, you know, game manufacturers and authors, especially authors of Choose Your Own Adventure, but, you know, authors of literary fiction too, they make us fall in love in, to some level or at least build some kind of a relationship and, and um, uh, emulate some kind of an intimacy with characters, with those characters, because in the, in the novel it's an iterative thing that we don't really get to do it properly in a properly interactive kind of a way. But in games, that can be gamified and it can be gamified really you know, in a relatively straightforward way. That is to say, it can be gamified without AI. So Love Plus, um, there is three characters, Rinko, Nenny, and Manaka, and you choose one of them and you become a girlfriend of them. So this is very popular with young Japanese men. And those young Japanese men tend to be men who do not, you know, not particularly interested in having a girlfriend right now. Um, they, they actually, this does seem to form something of a substitute for a relationship for a period of time while they're playing that game. And these girlfriends are, are very demanding of men's time. The men have to log in and they have to pay attention. And if they don't pay attention or if they forget a birthday or an engagement or something like that, they, you know, the, the relationship gets frosty. So the sort of interpersonal stuff and not just the, the happy interpersonal stuff um, is gamified um, in this game. And people fall in love and take this very seriously. They go on on vacations together with their Nintendo DS, or they go on big dates where restaurants will set up a whole night of Love Plus people, and there's just these dudes and their N Nintendo's DS. Um, and this seems to, to act as something of a substitute for relationships. It is no, you know, it's, it's not the real thing. It's not as good as the real thing. It's not nearly as fulfilling as the real thing, and it's problematic in all sorts of ways. But for those people, it's filling a niche for now. Can we click again? Particularly for this Cell 9000, he was a player who famously married one of the Love Plus characters, Neni Anegasaki, um, some, some years ago. Um, and there were lots of media stories about that. I don't understand because the video of the wedding is um, in Japanese and with Japanese subtitles. And so I don't completely understand many aspects of, you know, how Neni came to, to, to knowing that they were getting married and and you know, buying into the whole thing. But the story was that as far as Cell was concerned, um, he needed one video game character in his life and that was all. Um, click again, please. I was recently at a, con at a conference um, on love and sex with robots and one of the speakers was this um, character, Dave Cat. Now Dave Cat has, he describes himself as an idolater with two L's in the idol um, and, and robosexual. Um, and he's very excited about the prospect of sex robots, but his current or well, his long-term wife, he's been married to her for many, for several decades, as far as I understand it, um, is a real doll called Shidori Kuroneko. And he speaks of her the same way that many people speak of their spouses or significant others. Um, Dave is under no illusions that Shidori, Shidori is a person, um, but, you know, he insists that his relationship with her is in some sense is real. Um, and, you know, I think it's worth going and having a look at it because he's he's a more sympathetic character than I can describe it um, and, and a more interesting character than I can describe it. But the thing is that both Cell 9000 and Dave Cat are not out there on the market looking for relationships with real people. And that's the important bit because I'm going to make a huge change of pace now and start talking about some of the consequences of these technologies. If you were to assume that to some extent they, these technologies can use up people's time and use up their headspace and meet some of their social desire to be in, you know, friendships or um, romantic relationships or sexual relationships. Um, we can move on. 
And we're going to move on, one more click, please, to the incels. Very unsympathetic characters. Um, on the top left here is the New York Times um, story from the 2014 Ila Vista killings, in which a young man who was angry at the world, but particularly at young women at the University of California, Santa Barbara, for not sleeping with him, um, basically killed his flatmates and then went on a big rampage through town and killed a lot, you know, a number of, a significant number of people. He, um, I know it's not traditional to say people's yeah. names in these circumstances, but I also believe, you know, he's dead. Um, so he killed himself at the end of this and he's not ga ga gaining anything from this. Um, he became a bit of a, a, a unlikely sort of um, figure of, admiration in the involuntary celibate community. He referred to himself in his various, you know, raving manifestos as an incel, which is invol involuntary celibate, basically somebody who's not having sex, not because they don't want to have sex. And uh, the top right is a character called Alec Manassian, who went on a rampage and referenced um, referenced Elliot Roger in just before he did so on Facebook. Um, and he drove a van through a street in Toronto and killed a number of people as well. So there's a real temptation here to, to draw a line from people like these two. There was a recent case in Cornwall in England, I think um, England's worst incel violence that, um, you know, in, in recent times. And, and one can pull a few things out of this, but the people are, who do these things tend to be young men who are frustrated, incredibly frustrated at the fact that they don't have uh, partners and that they seem to be frozen out of, you know, any kind of mating market. Um, and they feel very, very entitled. They feel entitled to sex um, and to, you know, sex with whomever it is that they they desire. Um, and, it, and they spend a lot of time on the internet. And so it's actually very tempting to say that this is a problem of, you know, Western educated, um, relatively rich young men, and it's a problem with the internet and the internet hates women, etc. In fact, the hashtag not all men came, you know, came out first, I believe, straight after the Elliot Roger issue, as did the response, yes, all women. Um, however, and this might be kind of, um, difficult, you know, for, for some people to, to square, but I will make the argument and I'm happy to come back to the argument. This is not um, a problem that's restricted to a particular country or a particular language group or a particular culture or even a particular time. Um, sorry, I'm clicking away again. Kayleen, could you click on the next and one more? A month before Elliot Roger, um, you know, went rogue in um, Ila Vista and, and killed all those people, in the northern Nigerian town of Chibok, um, the Boko Haram insurgents kidnapped 176 young women, girls, basically schoolgirls, um, and took them away. And when and this is not the only time that Boko Haram has done this. Um, one of the ways in which Boko Haram recruit young men is that these are young men who are forsaken not only by the mating market, they can't find a wife because they can't afford bride price. They have no prospect of finding bride price because they um, employment is so scarce in that area and there's no way to make the kind of money. Um, the political scientist Valerie Hudson talks about Brian Price being a, a regressive tax um, levied on younger men by old wealthy and, uh, older wealthier men. Um, and that certainly seems to have all sorts of negative consequences. Um, and, and young men in places like um, Chibok will sometimes be involved or at least be, be recruited and radicalized by the prospect of, um, of a bride. Um, and that bride is basically somebody who's been kidnapped and they've left a little bit of money on the ground, supposedly for the girl's family. Uh, the Mumbai hotel bombings, again, um, the people who carried this out, I'm not talking about the people who planned it or the political agenda behind the planning of the event, but the people who, who did the work on the ground were all young men who had been recruited because their families could not afford bride price for them or for their brothers. And they were promised by the leaders the, that their families would get the money for their brothers to be able to enter the mating market. So, um, they, they, you know, one can go on and on to make the, the link between incels in the West and incels in other parts of the world. But historically, there has always been a problem with young men who are unable to make it into the mating market, unable to, to um, 
establish themselves sufficiently to be attractive to a woman or to a woman's family if it's that uh, society that arranges marriages in that way. Can we click again? Now, historically, that incel problem has um, often resulted, you know, when, when you have an excess of uh, uh, unmarriageable young men, those men will gravitate either to militias or they will gravitate to the army where there is an army. And um, here's Napoleon for a bit of a change of tack on the day of his greatest victory, which is at Austerlitz, where his 68,000 forces routed the combined Austrians and Russians, who were about 95,000 people. Um, so there are 160,000 men, mostly young men, at Austerlitz, mostly low status men, actually. And the dead were certainly more likely to be am among the low status people. What made Napoleon you know, good was not only his tactical acumen, which allowed him to win with inferior numbers at Austerlitz. He normally outnumbered his opponents by a great deal. He once boasted, boasted sorry, to the Austrian foreign minister that you can't stop me. I spend 30,000 men a month. He spends 30,000 men a month. So you think about that. That's 1812 um, when he said that, which is, you know, barely 200 years ago. Compare that level of mortality with the 7,000 US military deaths in Afghanistan. Um, now, obviously, there were a lot of other people who died who were not US military, far more Afga Afghans, for example. Um, but the number of, of US military deaths was incredibly, you know, politically unacceptable um, and was something that, you know, the Amer American society has obsessed over for 20 years. And, you know, rightly so, I think. Um, Whereas Napoleon, you know, in 1812 went into Russia and lost 340,000 French men's lives in six months. Um, and so it seems, and, you know, an analyses by historians and by uh, students of security tend to bear out the fact that uh, when there are, are surpluses of young men who are unable to find their way in, in the mating market, basically, they um, will find one another and they will become more likely to, to cause violence within their society, as well as that society is much more likely to march to war or to go into some kind of colonial expansion, which is pretty much the same thing. There are a lot of incels throughout history. There are a lot of people who died before they ever had a chance to marry because they were striving to avoid becoming incels, basically. And yet, none of you listening to me today, me included, descend from a single lifelong incel. Not one. All of our ancestors managed to find a mate and mate and start a family in whatever ways, sometimes in you know very sort of um, obvious and standard ways, but no matter who they were, no matter who they were attracted to, what their gender identity was, etc., our ancestors managed to basically get their genes together with someone else's genes again and again and again and again. And so when our ancestors, the people who are alive and who populate the world today, when their um, uh, genes and where they, with the information that makes them who they are have encountered the possibility of becoming an incel, they have basically found ways to avoid that. Not always, you know, not everybody with those genes was, was successful, of course, but basically there's, a, there's this very strong urge to of, to climb in status and respect and to become somebody that is potentially marriageable. And that is, you know, the, the more likely you are to be frozen out because you, you started out poor, because you're young, because you're in a bad situation, or because demographics are not in your favor, the more likely you are to strive in that way and to behave in that way. And so there's something to be gained about the incel mindset from that without being sympathetic to their, their ways and means. Okay, so um, if we click again, this issue, which I've kind of overcooked here because I'm, I'm now not, not gonna have very much time, is what I call the problem with men. Basically, the diff a, a big sex difference in that kind of frantic striving for status and respect and the willingness to take risks and the willingness to be violent about that causes a lot of the issues that exist with masculinity but of course, not all societies are like that top left-hand one where there are, you, there's lots of men who completely, you know, who never get to, to mate and never get to have a family and very few women who never get to have a family. There's a few men who have thousands of offspring, 
no women have more than 15 or 20 offspring in their lifetime. Um, and there are three factors that influence this. Um, sex ratio, the, whether or not you allow polygynous marriage, and certain types of economic inequality. Now, I'm going to have to click forward a bit here because I went a little bit, I expanded a little too much on Napoleon, um, only to say that when the sex ratio is very female biased, the, the world looks like a sort of nightmare for conservatives. Marriage rates go down. Um, there's more infidelity. Men do less um, in, in the relationship, etc. cetera. Um, there's more teenage sex. There's more unprotected sex. There's more sexually transmitted infections, etc. cetera. Click again. Um, whereas on the right-hand side, when there are an excess of men, it's a more sort of competitive, robust, you know, um, men competing with one another kind of an environment. Uh, but it actually favors um, female mate choice. And I'm just, the metaphor I'm going to use here is price, basically, where um, there is, in fact, we, we don't even need to go through that right now. I might just go through this. These are my collaborators, Candice Blake and Daniel Ruta Butterham, on a paper where, if you click again, we've mined the internet and six billion tweets for um, information about incels to find out where the incels are doing what they're doing. Click again. Um, and we've asked questions about, you know, is it sex ratio? Is it the proportion of women who are single, the proportion of men who are single? Is it gender inequity? Is it income inequality that's causing um, local, you know, it, lo local internet-based behavior? Or is it just that the internet hates men and that, uh, hates women, sorry, and that's why incels are all over the internet? Um, so we click again. Um, and what we found basically was um, through a, a fairly extensive analysis of American incel online activity that high inequality and male biased sex ratios are the big predictors of how many incels are out there. And that is, you know, when the males outnumber, when men outnumber women, um, then there, there are going to be a few men left out, basically. Same as when women outnumber men, there'll be a few women left out. So there's more frantic striving in a male biased sex ratio. But there's more frantic striving when income inequality among households is high. That is to say, where the difference between the have-nots, the haves and the have-nots is high. Let's click again. That's just a, an, an image showing you how much incel traffic there was. It's not that important. Um, and we've, we've shown basically inequality and the sex ratio are the most important things. I'd like to get down a couple more slides. Um, OK, so. What is there some kind of technological solution? I'm sorry to surprise you. That, that that was a good one with Jordan Peterson there. Sorry to surprise you with a picture of Jordan Peterson. I'm sure that's not what you wanted to see when you came to the seminar. Um, but anyway, how do we sort of um, diffuse this incel problem? The first possibility, and the incels say this, is reduce sexual inequality by basically making sure that every you know there's one bride for every man, and it is a very man-focused kind of a an argument can make monogamy great again. Now there is a, the, there are reasons that societies that have um, allowed monogamous marriage and tried to outlaw polygynous marriage, which is one man, one powerful rich man marrying many many women, um, and therefore you know creating a, a biased sex ratio, a de facto biased sex ratio. Um, there are reasons that those societies are more peaceful and more cooperative. Um, and so Peterson, you know, has a bit of a point here, but this this argument's also often wound up in the incel world with, um, and let's wind back gender equity while we're at it. Um, now, neither of those are really good suggestions as far as I'm concerned. Basically, what they're saying is what a lot of conservatives want to say, which is let's just wind back the gains of the sexual revolution. And I imagine that most of the people in the audience today feel that the gains of the sexual revolution are super important, possibly the greatest emancipation that's of any people that's ever happened in history, certainly in terms of numbers, and um, it's not worth winding back, um, even though perhaps there are certain complications and aftershocks. The other possibility is we can reduce income and wealth inequality, important because those are very toxic things. They have corrosive effects on societies, including biomating markets. Um, but the two I want to talk very briefly about are algorithmic matchmakers and digital lovers. So let's click on. Um, this is a, all the countries of the world lined up in terms of inequality. And if we click again, somewhere in the middle of those countries in the world is the mating market for heterosexual women. This is on 
um, one of the dating apps, okay? Not Tinder, I'll get to it in a moment. It's on Hinge, basically. And, and you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of inequality in how much attention women get on this particular dating app, but there's profound inequality in terms of how much attention men get. And this is kind of typical of normal mating markets. Super attractive men get lots of attention. Most of the men get modest amounts. A large number of men get no attention at all, whereas for women, it's kind of spread out a little bit more evenly. Um, but nonetheless, it's it's huge because this kind of inequality is the kind of inequality you have in Colombia and South Africa in places that are not known to be very relaxing places to live because of what? Frantic striving, usually by young disenfranchised men. Let's click again. Um, click Just click through to there. OK, um, thank you. One back. Um, so that was Hinge. Hinge is actually one of those matchmakers that tries to match you on some sort of compatibility of interests and the like. Um, Tinder, on the other hand, is very superficial. It's really does your profile look appealing or not? And there's a lot of, you know, very you can you can choose very quickly. And what these algorithmic matchmakers that are reshaping human mating markets are doing is they are um, creating more mating inequality because super attractive people can get all sorts of attention. There's nobody there as there would be at a party sort of to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, do you know they've got a partner or they've got three other partners? Um, and you aren't constrained. At a party, you're constrained by how many people can fit in the house or in the, in the club that you go to or you know the, at the concert that you go to, et cetera. Now, you know, all of the people, at least within a 5K or a 10K radius, are theoretically available to you. Other um, dating apps like OkCupid, okay you know, have very complicated algorithms based on all sorts of inf information that you put in, but it seems that that information isn't really helping. Um, it seems that they're not no better than just noise, at least according to the people like the sociologist Kevin Lewis who know about this. What I'm thinking is that potentially, I, I think it, it doesn't pay to be as pessimistic as Kevin Lewis is and to say machines will never be good enough. We know already they, they're good at being friends, they may be good at being lovers, and they could be good match matchmakers too. Um, it's just that we haven't got the right machine learning by data combination to create the kind of app that people want to use, use once, and then get off because, you know what, they found something that's, diver that's interesting to them for a period of days or months or pass possibly even a lifetime. So maybe algorithmic matchmakers can help solve it. Let's click through again. Um, and the last possibility is that digital lovers might do the trick. Now, I know this argument's out there. Let's click again that, you know, we could just deploy an army of fembots and that that will, you know, neutralize the incels and everything will be okay. Of course, you know, the notion, there's so many difficult issues in terms of weirdness, in terms of objectification, in terms of what it will do to us psychologically about how we treat other people, which I haven't even scratched on today. There are concerns about us actually being replaced in a way that is actually the benefit of them is that, you know, sex becomes a slightly lower stakes proposition. Um, there's concerns about the fact that they seem to mostly be built for heterosexual men. Well, the ones that we need to deploy in order to diffuse the incel problem need to be those kinds of digital lovers, but they needn't be quite so stereotyped. Um, and how do we get them to where they're most needed? Let's click again. That's actually relative. Oh, sorry. Um, so, you know, firstly, you don't have to want a digital lover to be your lifetime partner, but a digital lover that diverts you from the mating market for a period of time can actually potentially help take the heat out of that mating market, take some of the demand out of that mating market. So that's really what I'm arguing here. Let's go again. We know where to find, where to really concentrate deploying these things because we know where the incels are because of the internet, and because of where, you know, the, they'll, they'll tell us where they are. Um, and there are certain areas where they're a higher priority, just like there is bride price inflation in certain little pockets in South Sudan or in Nigeria or in, you know, any other country that practices bride price. You'll see those pockets flare up and that's what security agencies look for because that's a predictor of violence. Similarly, porn searches, that map of incel activity could just as well be a Pornhub search um, map. Um, and, and in fact, studies have shown very much the same thing that we've shown there. And then I think we can click on. So are we ready for digital lovers? No, we're not ready for digital lovers. It's really, really you know, complicated and there's so many issues to work out. But 
the prospect that they may in fact help to take some of the heat out of mating markets, that they might turn, you know, extend the benefits of the sexual revolution by taking some of the the notion that you know love is the same thing as marriage, is the same thing as lifelong commitment, etc. Um, I think that's a really exciting possibility. But how do we get them to where they're needed without you know some kind of tech colonialism that says you, you don't get a mate, but you get a, a, you know you get a machine? I mean, I think that you know Margaret Atwood has already written about that extensively and and far more eloquently than any nonfiction book could could say. Um, but the one possibility that I'll leave you with is the possibility that the high price luxury good, instead of the the destination wedding and the bride that you know. Um, wealthy, powerful, um, famous people, you know, will tend to recycle every 10 years or whatever, or five years, etc. I'm thinking, you know, Donald Trump type model people, um, that the, the, the high price luxury good shouldn't be a person. Uh, maybe if, if the machines can be so sophisticated and so toy like, perhaps they could divert the likes of Donald Trump for a period, um, or, you know, those kinds of figures, pick whatever figure you want, who, um, is it is defined by who they have on their arm um and uh, instead if they just had a gadget that distracted them for a period of time then perhaps that might make things a little bit better for everybody um and i don't know that's just a just a a um cheeky suggestion to finish off and i appreciate your patience both with my slides and with my expanding in the middle thank you very much thanks rob we are um, running uh, uh, over time, but I will actually um, pull out um, at least one question that is sort of a um, a combination of some of the um, comments in the chat. Um, and right. I mean, your research has looked at a particular way, but where we where a lot of people have um, brought it up, and Trang Fan in particular is got given us some information about what's happening in Japan about where are the women in this equation the women who are actually using digital lovers algorithmic matchmakers or indeed sex doll bots at the moment um, where do they actually um, fit in what you're doing or what you're seeing or what research do you think we need to do to look at the role of women in this piece well obviously um, I mean or doing as much research as possible, and particularly for diversifying that research into into um, different you know areas and different uses and different forms of technology, and making sure that you know in terms of users we're covering a as full an extent of, of human diversity as possible. Um, I think that the I think the incel issue is one that I chose to speak about today. I know it's very male centered. Um, but it's deliberately very male centered because you sit down to any news article, you know, any news bulletin. I did this with my son when he was about 12. And my goodness, one thing after another is really a problem of men, a problem with men's story, you know, problems of, of you know, particularly questions of, um, of sexual assault and coercion, et cetera. Um, but, you know, violence, into, violence against other men. Um, ridiculous striving for excess status signaling conspicuous consumption you know those are things that kind of occupy us that's what our gossip is about because I think those are the things that are dangerous around us so I think that um, it's a real challenge to try and address the incel issue because they're such unsympathetic characters a lot of people are like well just let them rot just deal with themselves they just need to learn not to be violent they're not going to learn not to be violent they're not going to do it out of some kind of sense that this is the most corruptive thing. We can't even get people to take a vaccine that's for the public good. You're not going to get people to opt out of their ambitions because they seem kind of Im impossible. So, so here we have these incredibly unsympathetic characters who are causing profound problems, um, and we, we can choose to, to write them off, which we're currently doing, or we can choose to address that particular issue. But there is so many deficits out there in the world in terms of so many lonely people, so many people who, um, you know, would would benefit a great deal from having access to these types of technologies. And I would hope, that, I think the danger is that we see what's happening with something like sex robots 
and that they're very, you know, they're gynoid and the users are very much m- m- men and it's a very niche kind of thing that's going on. And we go, let's just run these things out of town. Um, whereas I think that if we if we take a slightly more relaxed and a little more open, gee, we don't really know how this is going to go view, but let's have a look at it in a range of different contexts with a range of different people and find out what it is that they want to use um, and how they might want to use it. We Not only will we learn a great deal about human technology kind of interactions, we'll learn a great deal about people. Um, and we'll, we'll s- probably see um, various types of really, really useful technologies arising that service a range of different, uh, you know, people's, people's needs and interests and wishes and desires and in some cases paraphilias. Um, so, yeah, like I'm, I'm, I would love to see a more diversified discussion about sex robots. Um, he says, as he then goes on talking about the last two chapters of his, <laughs> of his book, which are a very male centric kind of view. And, you know, but I do acknowledge that there is male centric. The thing, I think the thing that's really cool one, as a student of behavior, there's so many things that are cool about this. I always wanted to build you know, virtual reality avatars that could move and shift in relation to what people want. We can actually start to understand what people's preferences are, including the sort of how gendered their preferences are and how they arise by freeing ourselves from the rules and the laws of physics and anatomy. And you're already starting to see that in 3D animated pornography, for example, in which there is, there's this immense proliferate, proliferative kind of imagination of what it is that people find interesting and, and sexy. Um, and I think that as, as we mature into having more open discussions about that sort of thing, I think that we'll start to, to really see more of people's diversity of interests coming out as well. Um, okay, just one extra one in talking about um, what you've said about um, the fact that looking at addressing issues of incels and looking at the fact that we should be let it relax and see how it plays out. Um, and there's, some, I agree that there's some merit to that. But most, very, very recently, I read about um, a series of sex doll bots that are that are programmed to simulate um, a lack of consent. Mm. So we're still talking, we're talking about things that are probably going to appeal at least to a subset of the incel population, though that's maybe a jump that I'm not qualified to make being a lawyer rather than a behavioural psychologist or an evolutionary biologist. Um, So I suppose my question would be, and again, I'm looking at from a legal perspective, in terms of letting it rip, do, what do you what do you think about that in the sense of should should we be intervening at the moment for those sorts of areas where we've already got a problem in real in real life for a lack of consent? The, the feeling would be the question might be around will they get that out of their system? Worst case, mm-hmm. best case scenario, or will it um, more likely to facilitate this concept that? Um, that a lack of will it normalize a lack of consent in their real life relationships? Yeah, I think that that's that's a really really important um, discussion, and it's one where I think you know not only do we not have nearly enough information about how people really will respond to it, I find it really hard to imagine a society that's mature enough to allow that kind of research to go on. I mean, can you imagine it? We have this nitpicking of ARC grants every year and, you know, anything that sounds like critical theory or whatever gets poo-pooed and, you know, pushed out of the way and stuff. But, um, but you know, it's, it, imagine if we were, you know, we're, we're, we're very tuned to detect people who are, you know, harming children and anything that looks like they're people who are harming children or people who have a preference that might allow them to harm children or that might be coercive to to other adults. We want to run that out of town. That's a very common social reflex and an understandable one and part of the domestication of humanity. But we just, we really, really do not know at the moment whether or not that which of those two options you outlined are going to prevail. Um, It's the same discussion we've had with, you know, um, rock lyrics and with computer games and with violent films. You know, and wherever the wherever the data is being um, 
presented, it seems that um, where either there's no effect and on an aggregate level, now, some individuals are inspired by nasty rock ly lyrics to then go forth and do nasty things, or inspired by computer games. Andres Breivik, the Norwegian guy, you know, he played a lot of Call of Duty, and then he went out and killed a phenomenal number of people. Um, and so we blame the computer games. But from what I can tell, the, 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 at, an, at an aggregate level, um, the effects are either sort of neutral or they take some of the... the they, um, they improve the situation ever so slightly. And they probably improve the situation because the time you spend playing Call of Duty is time that you're not out on the street wandering around with your, you know, AR-15 or whatever it is that you have. Um, the same discussion obviously has pertained uh, about pornography for the last 50 years at least. And there's these very strong calls from both sort of the um, radical feminism as well as the sort of family first conservatives that you know, porn's going to cause the world to implode and men to become more violent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it, there's an enormous number of anecdotes of people who are avid porn users who then go on to do hideous things individually. Um, and yet at an aggregate level, once again, there's either seems to be no net effect on aggregate levels of sexual coercion and sexual assault, or they've gone down with pornography. Um, which is not what, you know, was predicted in the 1980s. And I know that, that a lot of people will contest those statements too, because you can point to a bunch of studies. But so we haven't had the, you know, the maturity and the resources and even the sort of tools for discussing these things for, for porn and for video games. Now imagine machines that can emulate a lack of consent. I mean, it isn't that at one level, it is a machine. It doesn't give consent because it's not a person and it can't consent. We don't even know something like objectification. It's an object. Will having sex with an object cause people to treat people as objects more? You know, we don't know. There's no, there's no study that I know of that has asked, answered that question. But what we do know is that what people will do with those machines is the opposite of objectification. It's anthropomorphization. They'll treat the object like it's human. How does it affect relationships? We don't know. I'd love to do that work. I don't see myself getting funded by it just yet. Well, thank you so much, Rob, and thank you so much for spending extra time with us today. Um, considering thank it's you. 20 past two, um, I know people have asked questions and made co really useful comments in the chat. So thank you all for that. I'm sorry we can't get to them today.